paper to this conference, and you already mentioned my co-author, so it's David Aikman, uh, Dr. Lucilius, and Shichuan Ching, and given two of us are uh, at the Center Frame for the VIS, uh, obviously the usual disclaimer applies, but means that are the and not those for the VIS or the Bank of Kingdom. Now, it is sort of very well known that we can have very deep contractions which sort of have scarring or very long run effects. This is, I mean, the best known example if it was a GFC, but, and then, you know, even there were questions after COVID, and I guess, you know, then when we originally started writing this paper, uh, that seemed to be one of the issues. So there's an FSB report, oh, now COVID will be end up on the lower level. I guess now we have most countries uh, gone back to, to trends, so that may not be so relevant. And there's obviously a lot of, uh, or there's growing evidence of this. There's a paper by Chera just sort of surveying this this year. Now, but there's very little on sort of a deeper understanding what drives scarring, you know, where does it come from? Uh, and this is sort of a general uh, phenomenon or not. And clearly, this is a really important question for a policymaker um, because ultimately, if, you know, the macro model here is a deep shock, you're going to be recovered to trend. So if, you, if, if that's not the case, then you obviously your policy will be different, uh, will be, um, you should have different policies. And I'm going to, uh, talk later about this. Now, it's also a question, is it sort of driven by the shock? But we know the scarring is sort of after the financial crisis, and, you know, Alan sits in the room, so clearly there's, he's done a lot of work on this, but is it dependent on the shock or not? Is that, you know, does it occur from other big events as well? And then there's also a question, which is related to when you think about the unit world literature, you know, yes, you would have permanent effects, but you know, they would be for positive shocks, for negative shocks, or independent where you are. Uh, and as I said, the same point. Now, what, what we're going to do, and this is sort of a guess of, if we will differ from what's currently out there in the literature, we're going to do a very simple, I should actually go to here, we're going to do a very simple statistical intuitive test to detect scarring in the data. And we do this on the properties of long run growth. Uh, and then we're going to, and I'll tell you exactly what we do. So um, we're going to apply this to a sample of 24 countries from 1970 to now. They are mostly advanced economies, but we have a few EMEs in there as well. And what we're going to show is that very deep contractions. Um, so these are the sort of the worst, and actually the ultimate, what we're going to look at, the, the worst one year drops in growth rates, they have highly persistent effects. So you're not going to recover back to the trend, but they will be lower. Uh, once we go for less severe contract contractions, the we will basically you don't see any permanent scarring. Uh, it's really the size that matters; and it's not the cause. So, as I said before, we know this basically already for a financial crisis, but we find exactly the same effects for uh, when you have what we label monetary policy tightening or oil price shock. Uh, and and the literature I already touched about this. So, so why do we differ? There's obviously this very long unit root literature and uh for those who know Mika Eucilius he has been working you know he's in this and sort of you know there the, the real issue is obviously it's very hard to detect and I guess it's still not settled and this is the symmetry so if you have a unit root if you go with permanent shock up or down this will always be there uh then many other papers have been sort of looking at GDP movements around specific events again sort of you know take financial crisis or the chair Sarah Saxena paper, the 2008, they, they have financial crisis, they have uh, sort of big events, and then you say, look, do I recover or not? Uh, and then there's sort of a two, three papers out there who look at the, uh, you know, it's a shift in trend out, but on that. But again, uh, uh, you, know, you, you look at around events like the, the Blanchard piece is like around the GFC. And our idea, and this is really what I said, it's very simple. So think about a world where you grow whatever permanently, this is sort of your trend, then there's a very deep shock. If there is no scarring, you're going to recover to trend at some point. And what our some point, sort of, this is sort of how we're going to define it, but we'll say after 10 years, you know, we assume, you know, if there's no scarring, it should recover back to trend. Okay, so whilst initially, at the, if you take like a, a one-year horizon in the log level of GDP jumping down, yes, there should be a big effect. That should be much worse in compared to other times used in the literature. But, but after a really while, sort of this thing should be the same 10-year growth rate um, 
than, than in the average sample any other place. Now, if you have scarring, what's going to happen? You know, you have the big shock, but you're not going to recover. So this 10-year growth rate will be lower than the average 10-year growth rate in the sample. And that's, so we have very simple, this is super simple. So we can test this, you know, we take all these, we identify deep shocks, then we take the 10-year growth rate, and then we compare whether on average that's lower than the average 10-year growth rate at any other point in the sample. Clearly, there's a couple of questions. So how do I identify these team heroes? So what, what people did before, that's sort of a narrative approach. So you'd say there's financial crisis in this quarter. We're going to take an agnostic approach. So we're going to say, uh, we basically look at uh, GDP growth and we take, and we cut up percentiles in the total distribution and say, you know, you have the worst 5% percentiles, then you have 10% um, and so forth. Uh, and then that gives us the severity of the shock. Uh, no, shock is actually the wrong word, the severity of the event. Now, clearly there's also like, what is long enough? Because clearly if we go very long term, we should recover. But, you know, even, you know, basically you can think about this, you know, whatever. This is the shock is D and then whatever, this is one tenth of D still remaining after 10 years. Um, so if you go out to whatever 100, that shock will be super small in the long run. Now, again, we, this is sort of arbitrary. We'll, we're going to show you one picture and we actually look at it from one to 50 years. Uh, now, there's a couple of issues which crop up and I'm sure they already popped up in your mind. Uh, one issue is, which goes back sort of to work, which is also Blanchard looking at, but many of these events, and we know this, is like you had a boom ahead of uh, the, the the, the bust, so the typical credit boom bust cycle. Do so you have a crusade? So then you would think, ah, I don't know what you're actually picking up is not the drop, but that you, you know, there was the boom, and then, you know, after 10 years, this growth period is longer, but that's just reverting back to the trend. So I'm going to show you so two robustness checks where we control for this, and we actually follow Blanchard, where we say, look, we can actually start basically uh, two, three years earlier. That's what they do. So to have exclude the boom. Yeah. Sorry, could you just say once what the red and the blue lines are? Okay, sorry. Maybe I'll go back to what I, it's easier. So we are looking at the blue lines, essentially. Yeah, I haven't shown you the, the orange line, but I can also look. So the, the blue line is simply growth rates across different horizons. And what we're going to do, we take the 10-year growth rate from T0, and then compare at T0, you know, ten, like the 10 year ahead growth rate from T0, okay. and then compare that on it with the average growth rate in the sample. Now, one of the things, and this is the orange line, which is actually one of the other issues, is to say, okay, obviously, you know, this 10 year growth rate is actually also lower. You know, if you, in the run up to this event, this will pick up uh, sort of, you know, part of the, the permanent drop and it's actually not related. So, what we do in our main, main, Paper, we actually got to, so we compare, we actually leave them in the sample because if you drop 10 year growth rates, a lot of 10 year growth rates, you actually end up with that little information. So we compare basically the, you know, 10 year growth rates of T0 with everything else in the sample, and that includes these orange lines. So that is actually makes our test weaker. We have a control where we actually drop all those graphs to the T0s so that we drop these orange lines. Uh, so the blue line is an rate forward from the T zero or a big shot from the T. Yes, exactly. From the T zero, exactly. Um, now the other exactly. So this is sort of things which go. You know, our test may get slightly screwed up, sort of. The other thing is, and that's a big problem, and I'm sure I'm going to get lots of comments on it. Now, if you look, we go from 1970 to now. There's obviously a massive growth slowdown. So this will, you know, in some sense, if you look 10 years ahead, a growth slowdown, 10 years ahead will actually bias us to, to find scarring, but clearly it will also depress the average growth rate to, you know, from the, you know, outside the sample of T0, which sort of bias us against finding scarring. Now that we do a lot of tests and, uh, in, in trying to detrend this, and I uh, tell them in a second, so, and I'm sure, I mean, actually, we are convinced that we need to do our baseline results with a different method, but you're going to get the old paper uh, for the moment. Um, I talked about already about the, the run-up time. Now, and there's also a question where if, you know, 
you know, we've also got to check for uh, expansions. Um, and if you think about it, you could actually find that expansions could have permanent effects simply um, because, you know, if you think about the, the, the we compare, you know, if, if you include these heat contractions and you have sort of one, the, the alternative is this, you know, you have two distributions and one is very far to the right, including the expansions, the normal theory itself, but we'll do a two-sided test. <coughs> That that clock is correct, Rob. Uh, that clock is correct. Very good. Um, so what do we have? We have re GDP series seasonally. They are actually seasonally adjusted. They're quarterly from 1970 to 2019. Actually, we also have the the COVID period included as robustness. 24 countries with five EMEs. Um, then, as I said before, what are we going to do? We take the age quarter ahead real growth rate and actually. Uh, and that's basically what we had. Now, this is the key crux. So this is for removing the low frequency, slow moving trend. So what we're going to take is uh, an HP filter with this very large lambda, 400,000, which is roughly a linear trend. Um, there's a lot of work in the BS where we use it for, for credit gaps, and I've done a lot of work with this, and I think this is why we ended up with this. But I know that all the academics hate an HP filter with 400,000, so it's you're going to have your issues with it. But uh, we, as I said before, I love it. You love it? Okay, you can keep it as a baseline. Yeah, but but I think this is, uh, yeah, we, as I, we'll, we'll show you a slide where we do it. So we, we find it in the raw data. We can do a Hamilton filter. But the problem is that many of the trends, obviously, we're going to do 10 year ahead growth rates. If I do like a more standard HP filter with 1,600, all what I'm going to get is like I'm going to actually remove what I'm most interested in. So I need these long horizons. Um, as I said before, we're going to then, so we have the detrain the data, we do the growth rate. Then we're going to uh, look at, we take the distribution and um, then actually, uh, Around. Yeah, we, we, we take and do the percentile. And what I should say, we actually look at, because we have the cross country um, sample, we're going to actually normalize them by means of standard deviation. And then we chop off like the fifth percentile, fifth to tenth, and so forth. And this is the severity of the recession. And, and as I said before, it's very simple. So we're going to compare the 10 year growth rates at T zeros vis a vis all the other 10 year growth rates in the sample. And then we uh, bootstrap our standard errors and account for cross correlation in this Politis and Romano paper for And actually, before I show the results, I actually show you, make it really clear what we're doing, I show you the raw data. So, this is the log level of GDP in the US. We saw 1970. These red dots are the, what we identify as the most severe uh, T zeros. So, obviously, around the GFC, but we have also some T zeros here. Um, this graph shows you basically what we're doing. So I'm going to normalize all these T zeros on my zero. You see you have run up in GDP, you have this drop, and then whatever, it bundles. You know, it, it doesn't really, I mean, already visually, you see it's not recovering. And here, it's simply the 10-year growth. I mean, these are the, the growth rates at T zero. So this is the 10-year growth rate at T zero. That's the five-year growth rate. And you see, you know, there's basically it seems to drop down a bit already. And then, you know, very deep. Obviously, this is by definition, they're the worst contractions in the sample. There's some recovery, but it doesn't recover to the long run average, which is the red line. And that's basically already evident also in the, if I aggregate all across all countries, it's the same picture. I have the, you know, log level of GDP goes up, I have T0, by definition, very severe. And then I have this sort of step, step change that. Well, I can find a clarification. It's not fine that it, it's not that it just doesn't return to the red line. It doesn't overshoot to bring it back to the three, three trip. Correct. Yeah. But, but after 10 years, so this is the 10 year growth rate, Alan. So it should go back uh, to the to the 10 year growth rate. This is sort of, I should have said, this is the 10 year growth rate on average outside the sample out of. The window. Well, that's not only growth. That's the, this red line is the average ten-year growth, right? So in terms of you would expect that the blue line is the growth rate from T zero to here, uh, from T zero to here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So here is it's annual growth, and here's whatever five-year growth, and here's ten-year growth. And in some sense, what I'm going to do, I'm going to test the blue line vis-a-vis -vis the red line. 
That, that's basically all what we're doing, or to be more precise, in the sample, again, the blue line against uh, the, uh, the panel. Uh, and that's it. That's the result. I mean, I'll, can I show you the raw data? It's, you know, it's not that surprising that, yes, at these very recent, severe recessions, on the fifth percent uh, percentile, or the lower fifth percentile, we see that, yes, they are basically roughly one standard deviation below for the 10-year growth rate. So if you translate this, you're going to get a sort of a loss in the level of GDP of around, you know, close to 5%. So what are you going to see? You're going to see actually that the, the less severe the recession is, you know, there's no scarring. So essentially after the 20th percentile, you don't see any scarring anymore. So it's really these very, very severe shocks which are going to drive what we see. So then once I have a severe shock, I get scarring. So the question then was sort of, does it matter and what the cause is? And we're not going to talk about shocks, but it's really, so that's why we say it's the proximate cause. So we're going to split the sample first into crisis, non-crisis, uh, which is very easy because we have obviously all these papers who do crisis daily. And then we say, basically, if we find one of our T zeros, and it doesn't then, then whatever, late in Valencia date the crisis in whatever that quarter, and then whatever late one quarter before or two quarters later, we have a drop. So we say this is crisis related. And then obviously the, the others are not. But the others, we also actually, for the, the fifth percentile, I'm actually only looking at the fifth percentile, but now to be quicker. We, we then did sort of basically go through and looked at them. So you can actually identify relatively easy where are the oil price shocks. And then uh, David Aikman actually went through and looked at sort of when there was really rapid rises in interest rates. So we associate this with monetary pop. Yeah, they, you can actually, they fit the dates. I mean, Blinder had a recent paper where he looked at, you know, all these other recessions that are driven by monetary policy. But this tightening also had a cost rate. Yeah, I mean, look, this is why it's proximity cost, because you can say the GFC was also preceded by a tightening. So, yeah. But just to show, so if we do the crisis, non-crisis sample, what do you actually see? This, this, the, the permanent drop is really severe after non-crisis event, and it's much more severe than, than, than crisis. Uh, and actually, I should have said yeah, this is the split. So this is where our events are. These are the, the crisis, and these are monetary policy, and, and green is oil price shocks. And if you split them up, what you see actually is the biggest scarring happened after the oil price shocks. So sort of what we label monetary policy related is actually sort of less severe, but we can't separate them. Even I now have five more minutes. And actually, sort of this is an interesting graph. So here, this is the very well-known annual GDP growth, left skewed, and this is our sample. So this is the fifth percentile. You can actually see the, the permanent drop in the 10-year um, uh, distribution because it's essentially by model. So this is a, the low growth mode, and this is sort of the normal distribution. And these modes are statistically different. You can actually test them, and they're indeed statistically different. Now, there is actually little sort of, if you would think about a Markov switching model, you know, you would drop down to lower, you, you drop up, you would actually get a jump up. And in some cases, we find this, but this is actually not significant. And actually, this by model, by modality, starts to emerge, you know, from the fifth year onwards, you see these and seven years, beautiful two modes, and then 10 years as well. Um, just to make, you know, we said before, we will also look at, is this now, do we have permanent effect for contractions or, um, or expansions? And the problem is really like, it, you know, the, the, the standard test may give me a wrong idea. So what I'm going to do to to ensure that if I have a, you know, an expansion, which I again define as the top five percentile, but now on the right-hand side of the distribution, um, I'm going to drop left percentile so that you know the, the these very severe contractions don't drive me down what is normal and what is the average growth rate outside the expansion that's what we call a two-sided test um and just to show you because this is sort of because if you do don't do this it seems that they actually have permanent effect but they disappear um once i'm sort of they are driven because i have these very severe contractions at the bottom and indeed you know if you look at it these are i mean i'm tracking these are the expansions, and I'm tracking them over the 10 year time. And actually, they are sort of pretty much centered around zero. And actually, I, I, when I go back to my, if you take about those guys, they still remain in the very left of the distribution. Okay, so in my last two minutes, we do a lot of robustness checks. 
So this was the detrending. So there's no detrending. There's a Hamilton filter with 20 years. We do rolling averages. We actually remove uh, population growth. Results remain the same. Deep drop significant. Once you return to sort of less severe, uh, you don't get scarring. Um, we do sample splits. It's basically we have also countries which didn't have a crisis, so Australia. And again, you see exactly the same thing. You have um, the very deep uh, contractions have scarring effects, but the, the mild ones don't. This was the, 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 the time, you know, by definition, these are very severe events over the one year horizon. Once you reach year seven, it's roughly flat, the scarring effect, and then we do 50 years, but then <clears throat> the sample becomes very tight. Um, and again, we do different, how do you define? We say, look, this is quarterly, you can do many things, so it's totally robust. And it's actually also at the country level. So, you, I mean, here we have real problem. Didn't we have 10 years of growth rates? Uh, there are a couple of outliers where it's not significant. Um, but yeah, so the US is sort of not really, but most countries, it's, it, you see that they are permanent drops. And the question then is, so what does it actually mean? So if they're scouring in the long run, that clearly has implications. And this is sort of what I said before. First of all, actually, the standard ESG models are not correct because they would converge back to trend. And we find that for very severe shock, that's not the case. Equally, we have an homogenous growth model. Those are typically symmetric, and we don't find symmetry. So what you really need, and this speaks to, I guess, macro models, which have you know, occasionally binding financial constraints and financial frictions. <clears throat> um, but many of them actually don't have scouring as well, because you jump back up. So, so really, you need to, I guess, sort of there's a paper by Correa Alto, where you know, financial constraints and endogenous growth, and that would be sort of what we see consistent with with what we find. Also, the paper of the, you know, the death trap by me and Kovacs is really sort of seems to consist with what we find in the data. And as a good policymaker, I have obviously policy implications, but I think the, the, the key one is really sort of, again, it's a Blanchard point to say, look, you do not want to end up that I have these very big severe shocks. And so that's where I need to uh, avoid them. If you think a bit more about day to day, policymaking is really, you know, once we had a severe shock, assuming that you revert back to trend will give you misleading policy signals. And now I get the red card and I'm done. Okay, okay let's hope we have some questions. Yeah, an obvious comment, and just a comment is that whether you get in that bottom 10 percent is unbelievably dependent on the policy response. And COVID is, I know you didn't show the results, including COVID, but let's be blunt, we are where we are because. Globally, they could get you soon. I mean, so the COVID overdid it, obviously, frankly. Uh, you know, yeah, all the things about inflation, but from a growth perspective, um, yeah, and it's been, I can't even test it. I don't even yet have, yeah, of course, not. So, yeah, right. it, it was nice when I said it's an observation, um, no, not, not criticism. You mentioned Markov switching it from when I think I'm not going to do results, so I don't actually, I'm old school, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's incredibly arbitrary, but uh, uh, kind of modeling. But um, did you do anything with that? I know you mentioned that in passing. It's so Markov should switch and give it should be giving me three modes. Yeah. Because I jump down, I stay down, and then I may jump back up. Yeah. And then I should actually find try modality because the, the jump up should be actually, yes. and that's what we don't find. I mean, we don't find that. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering how many long expansions you even have in the sample. So talking about uh, whether or not histories is may also possible in the other side. I mean, one example which I was also uh, thinking about is, so for instance, the euro area double the recession. How do you treat that? Because I mean, um, with so, your 10 years window, you will not uh, see any recovery in the first place. And the thing is with Recessions that clearly identified upswings are harder in that sense. No, so, so there's so the double dip. At some point, we actually only say, let, "Look, we have this double dip problem, so let's look only at the first as, as one, just statistically, because we obviously, you know, we, we might have this step down. So if we have only one dip, uh, and that the, the results go through. Now, the the expansion. I'm just being agnostic. So I can look at my GDP distribution. I take the five percent tail. Uh, the five percent right hand tail now and say, look, what happens at these two dealers? Yeah, I don't find that that is sort of in some sense easy. Um, 
but and then you don't find and there it seems that you don't find that they have permanent effects which would be exactly if you have endogenous growth like a positive you know productivity shock you should actually be boosted and you should be higher but that's not but what if you're the next shock comes you can never have such a long position uh, and you mean the expansions are never long enough um but that's what a standard model will tell me but there, there should be you know equally for the deep recession shouldn't i be popping up again you know there shouldn't be some positive shocks coming up in three, four, five years. recovery and another shock comes i cannot have this okay so now that's true I'll ask one unfair question. I know it's unfair because people always ask me about our paper, which is especially here because the 1970s are a big part of your story. So, uh, do you have end shocks or is it one shock? So, what, what is, can you put this in a context where there's a global trend, global uh, shocks, and uh, I people have... might worry about like the inference. Are we really seeing end observations or are we seeing just Okay, we threw in time fixed effects. Yeah. It doesn't, that's, it remains robust. Okay. Good, good answer. Like it looks even more. Robust. It does look strongly, yes, exactly. <laughs> it, yeah, here, but. How yeah. would that make it better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess, sort of, yeah, you actually have more scarring and then since, like, yeah, that's for sure. Maybe it's better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, maybe that should be a lesson. It's. Yeah, it's it's good. Yeah. good. Anyway, uh, the other question is, um, what models can deliver that kind of asymmetry? I mean, maybe we'll hear about this later. But uh, you've mentioned occasionally by the constraints, but what about? I mean, another example would be a, a downward rigidity, a downward dominant rigidity, like downward dominant wage rigidity. So when the economy gets hit with a contraction, we go prices can adjust to meet. I think we've had that. We've done that in our paper and it's now. Shut it on the tactics, but it, it's another option. Okay. And that gives me the one side in this as well. Yeah. I think we are agnostic. Yeah. That's good. Okay. One more. Yeah, you told us that the second uh, you are rethinking the methodology. You are now thinking about a different approach that would be our presenting the old version of the paper. No, no, I'm detrending because the, the HP field always gets comments. Okay, which, this is the only thing we're going to change. Yeah. Okay. So we actually want to change it to basically GDP per capita. That seems to be, you know, and then do the, you know basically take that as the baseline without detraining anything, and then throw the whole detraining story at it with all the different things. And but yeah. Okay. Thank you. So why? So um, do you really have to? Because what if the scarring shows up as a very persistent fault in GDP? In GDP though, then you're kind of throwing out the interesting variation by. You know, um. You mean you should not? We should start with the yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the one story where I think it's sort of economic meaningful to trade this GDP per capita. That's why we thought this is going to be our baseline in the sense take GDP per capita mm -hmm. in levels, and then you know, because clearly there is a downward trend, and you could say is that scarring or not? Maybe, maybe you're right. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Sort of, we got the detrending always, so yeah. Uh, for including the paper into the program. So uh, before I get started, like the users strictly are only not necessarily uh, the ones of our employers. So um, uh, basically, to start with the motivation, I think after the first talk and the general theme of the session, we don't really much need much motivation introduction. But like you're basically interested in three major questions in this project. So first of all, do firms adjust their investment and innovation in response to a recession? Because if they do, um, we have reason to think that uh, cyclical movements in the economy, in particular recession, translates into what we typically think is the main driver of long run growth, uh, investment and innovation. And through that, we would see an interaction between cycle and trend in this setting. And through that, we should also think of that um, long run effect that recessions are uh, going to have long run effects in such an environment. And um, in this context, we are also interested in the question what specific shocks and friction, frictions play at the firm level. And in general, when looking about uh, when thinking about the empirical evidence on these issues, we particularly look into time series evidence and so on, but we have very um, sparse evidence at the firm level. And this is basically what this paper does. Um, we present from that empirical evidence on the adjustment of investment in innovation, which we have along uh, various dimensions. 
um, in a crisis, specifically during the COVID-19 episode and for Germany. Um, and we connected to histories and effects and TFP. So I'm mainly focusing on the on the on the data um, in that in, in in this presentation because we have a large firm level data set with granular and uh, unique joint information on um, many variables and most importantly the adjustment of investment in innovation, the actual realized investment in innovation versus the pre-crisis plans. And um, we also have the production decrease to the crisis, so not just any production decrease, but really that which can be attributed to the cyclical change in the economy. And um, in addition to that, we have the reasons for adjustment, we have the expectations at the firm level for both their own economic outlook and the macroeconomic outlook, and alongside various firm level frictions, including also the role of government support um, that the firms receive. And um, we also have a theoretical part of the model, but this is um, a smaller part compared to the data, and um, in which we have a medium scale DSG model with endogenous technology growth, and that model we predominantly use for macroeconomic dynamics and working out the long run TFP effects and the long run effects of a recession, and predominantly to use it um, for scenario analysis in this context to work out different um, recession scenarios because we have the data for the specific crisis episodes, but we can uh, work with the assumptions and see how this um, affects the long run effects in this context. And um, yeah, so to go right away to the results. So what we see in this um, data set is that we observe a downward adjustment of uh, innovation investment by firms in response to the crisis. So in terms of the share of the firms, it's about 25% of um, firms uh, are, uh, which invest in R&D and about 20% of firms um, uh, with, uh, with uh, technology adoption plans. And with uh, R&D and technology adoption, I basically mean the distinction R&D is like, uh, directed at frontier, frontier innovation and um, uh, technology adoption investment covers everything else which is not meant for R&D and it's not covered, uh, not meant to um, generate a payment, for instance. And uh, we see that these cuts that firms undertake are large and economically substantial, meaningful in that sense, on average, like 750,000 uh, euros um, in R&D or um, about 950,000 uh, for adoption activities. And um, uh, with this data set, we generate a measure of innovation investment of the uh, 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 innovation investment response due to crisis induced output drop. So, in which we uh, link the crisis induced output drop to the uh, probability to decrease investment in R&D and adoption. And we see that if, if a firm um, observes a, a, a decrease, a production decrease or decrease in business activity due to a recession it's 50% uh, more likely to decrease its investment in R&D and about 40% for the adoption margin. And we also have this measure um, in, a, in a continuous way and there we can see that a one percentage point fall in output at the, at the firm level induced by the crisis resides in a cut of R&D and adoption activities by respectively 0 0.6 percentage points. And um, yeah, so as to the drivers of adjustment, um, we have macroeconomic shocks, uh, the various, uh, so we basically have various, various information on the underlying macroeconomic shocks, and you can also disentangle shocks versus um, structural drivers here, and the most important uh, shocks in this context are uncertainty, which is not surprising in the context of the major recession, COVID restrictions, and importantly, like from the angle of this paper, also um, a fall in demand at the firm level. And um, as a so, and this is important for also macroeconomic policy because it shows it also shows some direction in the that um, we have reason to think that um, a cyclical fall in demand also translates into long run growth effects, and through that has long run effects also from that angle. And as to the main driving shocks, we see a synchronized pattern of R and D and technology adoption activities, which means that it's the same drivers behind the adjustment and r and technology adoption, as is typically also um, the case in the models um, which work out these effects. And um, we also explored the information and expectations about, uh, 
uh, firms' expectations about the future. And here we see that, that in particularly also the role of future demand is important in the setting because like, if firms expect um, future demand problems, let's say within the next six months, um, they are 35% uh, more likely to decrease their R&D investment and about 30% for adoption activities. Now, in our sample, as you, should, as you see in the decomposition of the and um, shocks that I'm mentioning here, financial shocks are not important for that specific crisis episode, but this is as we were um, mentioning already a little bit in the previous discussion, also a reflection of the fiscal policy and measures and also in general financial policies which were implemented at that time, and especially also in Germany, because they went directly to the firm level and also um, directly targeted to firms which were affected by the crisis and in a matter of just a couple of months in the end. So direct emergency assistance to the firm level. So it's not surprising that firms do not uh, report financial constraints. It's important because they simply were not at that time. However, we still see the role of financial frictions in the expectations about the future because if in case firms see problems with financing, they're also about like 30% more likely to increase there are indeed investments. So the role of financial fictions is there, but it's not there for that specific price. And um, this is also what leads us to think that the estimates that we are presenting here are conservative in the sense that, uh, of magnitude and the strength of this cut in general in a crisis. Because as I said, like the fiscal support, like both fiscal monetary stimulus, but also really the um, measures, the emergency assistance, which went directly to the firm in the form of direct fiscal transfers and also guarantees, financial guarantees were sizable and also immediate. So they cautioned a lot of the, of the form from the firm perspective, basically driving a wedge between aggregate output and the situation perceived at the firm level. And um, as we see from the data set, uh, financial constraints were not binding at the time. And in general, like the crisis was expected to be short-lived. So it was very different in that sense. Um, to the financial crisis, for instance, in which um, perhaps, um, especially due to a longer orientation of um, innovation investment firms were inclined to maybe smooth out uh, the, the decline was from me. Now, um, yes, the data. So it's a large representative sample of firms representative across sector and size categories, meaning it's not just uh, manufacturing firms, but really the whole population of firms. And um, this is important also thinking of non-frontier innovation because this is a, a particularly important for smaller firms. And it's the Bundesbank online panel of firms, in, which is a regular survey conducted by Bundesbank, but we had the chance to insert our specific research questions in terms of uh, for the innovation uh, investment, and special innovation group in 2000. 21 the third quarter, we have 5,500 firms um, through that. And um, we have the granular information and in particularly also the joint information on, this, on all of these variables, which is typically not the case. So, in part, so we have information on frontier innovation and non-frontier innovation, I said that already, but we also have planned versus actual investment, which means we had the plans that firms had 2000 and at the end of 2019 for 2020 versus the actual undertaking investment uh, in the course of 2020. So we have the plans, we have the actual investment, and through that we can identify what sort of change. So once again, so you have the 2019 plan and the 2020 executed. Yes. But not like say the 2021, how much they did. Like, did you did you follow them over time some more? Or? We did not, but we have like some measure which basically shows whether or not there would be an overshooting afterwards, because right. I guess that's what you're right. what you're yeah, having to have to close my lab because of COVID, but then next year I'm gonna run an extra hard. Yes, no, so we we have we have that for the aggregate basically in the end. So I can talk about that a bit more towards the end. And um so, and then we have the cyclical drop in production of business activity, depending on where the, in which sector you are at. And then the reasons for adjusting on investment in technology, in which we can also decompose cyclical versus structural reasons, because not all of the adjustment may be due to, to structural changes, uh, to cyclical changes, and as well as a set of different shocks in this context. And um, the world of expectation that the firm level both about their own, Situation about the future, 
then um, current level financial fictions uh, financially and um, also the government support measures that they received and also the history of these uh, financial fictions in that sense. And as well as a, a, a general set of farm controls. And um, uh, so again, like the coverage is basically across the uh, entire farm distribution. And um, yeah, as to the direction of change, so I will explain most of the uh, tables by means of R&D and then just quickly comment on how it differs from um, uh, for technology adoption investment. So here for R&D, first we're looking at the second column. So for those that didn't plan R&D, not many started it. So uh, that means um, the action of adjustment really happens on the, on the extensive margin. So uh, very few firms started with R&D um, in response to the crisis. Then of those that planned R&D investment, we see that like of 25% decided to decrease 6% of so the minority of firms increased. And as we will see also in the amounts, the amounts that they changed were small, whereas the amounts that were decreased were large, leaving us in the aggregate with a big dollar of adjustment. And I mean, with technology adoption, shares are similar also with the respected excess of margin by the smaller share of firms, which decreased and increased to about 20%, which adjusted their investment downwards. And um, I mean, for those, um, we have written in the, in, the, in the questionnaire also information on um, those firms that did not adjust because it's also important and informative to know what is behind um, the reasons for non-adjustment. And there we see that 46% of firms did not experience a sufficiently large change, um, which would have warranted such an adjustment. So they were not sufficiently, uh, you could interpret it as that they were not sufficiently hard hit by the crisis. And um, then we also have the role of um, financial uh, uh, resources here because um, another like 32%, 33% state that they had enough um, financial resources, even though their conditions changed, but they um, had sufficient financial resources to counteract um, the effect of the crisis without having to adjust um, uh, investment in innovation. And Again, like also like the, 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 the blue and the red bar here shows that um, altogether uh, only a small fraction of firms were not able to adjust it in either direction. So this was not really the binding constraint here all in all. And but still like in, in, uh, investment in innovation more generally and especially R&D is of course a long-term orientation project in that sense that if uh, agents expect it to be short-lived, they're pro probably less declined to decrease. Um, and since uh, COVID was perceived as transitory in the sense that it's not the reflection of uh, 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 fundamentals like, for instance, in the Great Recession, there's reason to assume that this is that this played a role here as well. And then as to the magnitude of R&D investment, so first of all, like we see here in terms of the plans, that they are, of course, heterogeneous, as you would expect um, um, uh, from like, just thinking about R&D and the distribution of firms more generally. And we see that on average, um, the decline, the decrease um, was about 750,000 uh, euros in response to the crisis in the first year in any case. And uh, also the average decrease increase of the small, uh, remember it's not just a small share which increased, but also the average amount of these decreases was small, which leaves us in, on balance dealing with a negative amount. And this pro-cyclical adjustment here, we do another split basically between four innovators, those that regularly invest in R&D and also with a budget, um, no, without a budget, that uh, invest regularly in R&D. Um, that there, the prosecutor uh, adjustment is even stronger. So you see that this is really also a margin that those firms that are important for research and development and the aggregate also use this margin of adjustment. And um, for technology adoption, similar patterns all in all, but a stronger adjustment in terms of uh, mean adjustment in this, um, in which we have here about 950,000. So, and this is kind of perhaps also a reflection that R&D is generally related to budgeting and all these types of considerations, whereas um, like whether or not long, more long-term oriented because it's in the end my own um, project that I'm working on. 
and I'm expecting to have a measurable outcome of it in the future, whereas uh, technology adoption activities, whether or not I invest in buying a specific software, whatever it may be, is easier to adjust and also has um, fewer long-run consequences. And as a result, um, firms are probably um, more flexible on this margin as well. And um, as to the questionnaire, so as to the reasons for change in investment, so we first of all allow um, also firms to respond in a way that they can clearly state this is not a cyclical shock that they're responding to. So it's another reason not linked to the crisis, for instance. So this is here. And then we also give them a set of um, options they can uh, they can choose when, what was important for their adjustment. And they can also pick uh, multiple reasons here. And um, so in, which we call now here macroeconomic shocks, but we obviously don't call it like that in the questionnaire because it's a firm survey or an art. But and the reasons we give them is uncertainty, demand, access to financing alongside other um, potential obstacles at the firm level, access to intermediate inputs, and so on. And in particular, um, closures of work restriction due to the COVID pandemic, because this may be important in particular in the context of this crisis. Now, and um, yeah, and here we have the reasons for downward adjustment and here on the left hand side for our review and here on the right hand side for technology adoption. And um, first of all, like one observation here is that as I said before already, um, the picture looks similar for R&D and, uh, and technology adoption, meaning that it's the similar driving shocks which are behind that. I mean, in the sense that whether or not how many firms adjust, how strongly they adjust is different, but it's really the similar driving shocks behind um, behind both margins of investment. And um, as a key reason for the adjustment in both um, emerges economic uncertainty, which is not surprising because this is a, uh, this, this is a long run investment. And of course, the COVID recession has also been um, characterized by a, by a large scale increase of uncertainty. And um, another important reason um, were the corona restrictions. And with corona restrictions, we, uh, we specified that it's the policy restrictions which were in place, like lockdowns, hygiene rules, and which were partially very restrictive in Germany. At the moment, we're also working out just more by exporting the regional variation along these lines. But and then, as you see here, like this, these obstacles posed by policy for containing the pandemic and so on actually lead to a downward adjustment in both innovation margins and not as for instance expected in the beginning of the crisis that it would trigger firms to in innovate themselves out of the crisis on the country at least based on our sample then lastly um as you can see here in the, in the blue bar here um about 50 percent of firms uh uh investing in adoption and uh, and and r d which made an adjustment uh, perceive the uh, drop in demand as important in their, in their adjustment. And from that angle, given that um, typically in standard macroeconomic models, and uh, we rule out basically the cyclical fluctuations in demand can spill over to the long run aggregate supply side. This is particularly uh, interesting in our view because uh, it seems that shifts, cyclical shifts in demand do have an implication for long-run growth investments and through that uh, for the trend path. And um, lastly, um, here we basically explored the impact of the recession of the production decrease due to the recession. And um, we study its role for the probability to decrease investment. Here we show it for uh, research and development, but it's similar for technology adoption as we work out more in the paper as well. And um, we observed that um, here uh, with and without firm controls, basically our result is robust in the end. And uh, if firms perceive a uh, decrease in production due to the recession, um, their probability um, to decrease investment uh, in, in R&D uh, increases by 50%. Or then in terms of the um, uh, measure interview that which we also have in percentage, so the percentage um, decline in uh, production due to the recession, one percentage point drop translates in 0 0.6 increase in the probability to decrease the best. Which, so this is clearly there. And again, this is really also the production decrease to due to the crisis. So it's not just some um, 
random shift basically in the sense, but we can uh, get this information from the questionnaire. And then about the role of expectations about the future. Again, here come what we see here is the role of demand also from that angle, because um, if firms expect a problem with demand um, over the next six months, their probability to decrease investment in R&D goes up by about 40%. And um, here, even though we do not see that, again, like going back to the reasons actually, like financing frictions, uh, access to finance is here. So only like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 all in all of the firms and 20 to 10%, depending on which margin you, you, look, you look at, perceived uh, access to finance as a constraint in that, uh, in that sample. But if they, but here through the expectations, we actually do see that um, if uh, firms expect problems of financing in the future, they're much more likely also to cut down their research and development investment. And about uh, COVID restrictions in itself, uh, here you can see like that the expect uh, that the expectations about them do not really uh, are not significant in that setting. So it was not like it was perceived as a temporary problem. We could see it that way, but not necessarily as a longer lasting one. And again, like the similar similar results also for adoption. And um, coming back to your question earlier, whether or not the firms actually overshoot subsequently. So as you can see here, it's actual actual investments in blue versus plans. So first of all, we see that it's uh, that they tightly move over time. So it's not there are no systemic downward revisions as such. But then the gap is really during the crisis time. And as you can see, even like the planned investment in innovation goes down afterwards. So this is, and we don't have these observations yet, but it's a more sustained decrease also from that angle. And also at least to that extent, what we have, we do not see an overshooting. Um, during the investment that we that that fell during that time, and yeah, so we have, we have a theory analysis which we mainly use for um, scenario analysis and working on long run TFP effects and so on. But I'm running out of time, so uh, it's time for, uh, for me to conclude. So we have like the firm level evidence basically from the most recent recession for Germany that from cut investment in innovation in response to recession. They are economically substantial cuts as well. Um, we see um, also the firm level evidence for spillovers from short run demand to long run aggregate supply, and it, both in the direct reasons and the expectations about the future. And we do view what we see, what we show in the data set as a conservative estimate of the adjustment due to the policy support which was in place and also due to the specific uh, nature of the crisis, basically. And with respect to the implications for macro modeling and policy, we think of that stabilization policies matter, especially also demand stabilizing policies in terms of the long run cost of recession and more strictly thinking of the role between cycle and trend. And uh, to, what, to what extent there are, there, are, there are distinct concepts. And we do view that uh, this is a direct evidence also for cycle trend interaction, and which kind of has doubt also on the world potential output and gap measures in that in that angle. Yes, you. thanks. Can I ask a question about um could you break this out by industry your results? By industry. By industry. So, so we at the moment we're working on heterogeneity analysis, which works out the sector, uh, the sector role in the set, uh, setting as well. But um, like at least what we can see here uh, as well. So we have it without firm and uh, without basically firm controls and with firm controls here. So this is the role of the sectors that uh, accounted for here in the end. But we see that the difference is not too large. And we are, again, we attribute this also to the policy measures which were with them. So I, the reason I ask the question is because I, I'm, the R&D numbers may, um, may, uh, may compute sense. The technology adoption though, I well, I guess it depends on how it comes to measure it. But I was, all I can think of is the firms, at least in the United States, went crazy adopting new technology during COVID. I mean, crazy. <laughs> they invested massive amounts in telecommunications, in security, in IT, in computers, um, 
Now, not in every industry, not manufacturing so much, but but I was thinking in, in the services and technology industries that they literally exploded because everybody went and worked from home. And they so that may not be measured in here, but that was the reason I asked. It's measured, question. it's measured here as well. I mean, we do did see that some firms basically yeah. increased as well. And this is, I mean, we can, for instance, we have here it's a small number of firms in the end, and we also it may have also been a part of expenditure switching within the technology adoption thing, for instance, towards more digital technologies. That's one option. You even have like this information survey as well, but we didn't want to overwhelm these people with too much information here, but we could actually go back and check because we also ask about, about that margin. But if you see here about the uh, about those which increased actually, even though they're small, right? Or the also the amounts they increased were small. Um, here, actually, the COVID restrictions for this small, it's very important for the increase. In that sense. So there's some degree of asymmetry here that in the end, the, the, that they, they may, there may be, for some firms, there may have been exactly the small difference there as well. Thank you. Um, okay. I, I like your thoughts. They are my colleagues. Can we be a little bit more cautious in terms of implementation? COVID was special. It was not a standard business kind of thing. And whether this is a long run effect or not, it's just going on. I would wait a little longer. The dip at the end to this graph is showed that there was this increase afterwards. So the integral over these two curves might just be similar. Um, two things on that. Um, first of all, um, we have the model to work out the long run effect. So we no, but the model is what you better put in this yeah. But there's the but there's the C you are aware of the CW, for instance. Like there's a recent paper by that as well that documents in a much more detailed, way more prominent innovation firm level type of story, not just two reasons that the recent that the innovation investment in Germany is really on decline since the since the crisis. So this is not just our story, but it's also consistent with other papers along these lines. And this is the trend. This is where we are. So it, it remains clearly below. And also, I mean, we don't well, have the expectation go down. So you would expect actually a blue line to follow the red line, but it does not because it seems to be taking up this. Uh, no, but this is no, no, this is this is in real time. This is for 2000 and this is for 2022. What they expect, this is what they say that they plan for 2022. So we adjust this basically over time. It's not a one-time stock taking. So this is basically updated every year here. So they're, they're a little bit above the plans that they had, but this is the new data coming in from last year. And it says that this is what they expect to plan. The basically, investment in Pula is increased in general 21. What is this, where's, where's the expectation for this year? Here. Yeah. But in general, like the evidence you present here, maybe other papers show that, but here right now, it would be cautious saying already I know that this is going to be super long run or it might bounce back, at least with this evidence I've seen. But what we are trying to say here is that the secret could work had an implication for the long run investment in innovation, and we can show this. Whether or not this will now overshoot in the future for other reasons doesn't matter that much for our story because I mean the, the current situation in Germany is overlaid by so many other things like also thinking of the energy crisis and all types of innovation along these lines. So of course we're cautious here. I get your point, but our point is that the secret could drop had implications for that, and this is what we can show it from that. All right. So thanks very much. So this is a paper about, uh, well, really about the long-run effects of uh, income back plus. So um, the question we're after is this year. So what are the long-run effects of corporate and personal income tax cuts? And we're going to focus on the effects uh, on innovation and on aggregate productivity. And more particularly, um, so spoiler alert, we're going to find kind of large effects. And so what are the channels with which those effects uh, operate? Okay, and so the first thing is we're going to present some new evidence on the kind of longer term effects of these uh, tax shocks. I'll describe a little bit about how we identify. It. And what we find is that the kind of tax cut we observe in the data for corporate tax cuts, we see this large and persistent rise in GDP and productivity and in uh, research and development. 
For personal tax cut, we see quite large, but uh, relatively transitory increases in GDP and productivity. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a model to these data. We're gonna estimate uh, an endogenous growth model. I said we're really sending endogenous growth model. I'll say what that matters. Uh, which are, it's going to have some features of the, uh, the tax code. And uh, what we learned from that is a really what it looks like is that R&D and technology adoption, or we call it applied research here, uh, really drives the persistence of the responses to the corporate income, income tax shock. Uh, why? Well, so cutting corporate income taxes increases the value of intellectual property in the economy, and that's going to provide incentives for innovators to create uh, new technologies. Um, for uh, personal income taxes, right, there's good reason to think that cuts in personal income taxes should increase innovation, essentially through a labor supply channel. Um, Axigen and co-authors of the paper that shows something like that. In our in our data, that channel is going to be comparatively small, but uh, but present. Okay, so uh, to summarize, I guess corporate taxes are going to have these really large and persistent effects on GDP, and uh, specifically that's going to come through productivity. Okay, so we want to understand why. And what the model is going to tell us is that's all because of these uh, corporate taxes having effect, effects on R&D and technology adoption. That's going to propagate the effects uh, long into the future. OK, so um, very quickly on the empirics. So um, the uh, the tax changes we use, this this is straight out of Romer and Romer. OK, so Roman and Romer, they identify these episodes that we can think of as being plausibly exogenous or as plausibly exogenous as possible. Really, this is kind of what we have. To look at macro uh, tax changes. Uh, Mertens and Rabin um, split that into personal and corporate taxes and, and show how to more precisely identify the shocks. Okay, so this we're more or less taking off the shelf, and for the longer term effects, we're using uh, local projections. Okay, so uh, let me show you the results. This is for corporate income taxes. Okay, so um, let me focus your attention for now on the top left corner. Okay, what this is, is this is in response to one of the shocks we observe in the data. This is the response of the corporate tax rate itself. Okay, the, the red line in the middle, that's the median response. This blue stuff, that's the estimated model. I'll say more about that in a second. Okay, but so there's this uh, federal income uh, tax cut. What this red line says is what happens to the actual effective tax rate in the economy in the years following that tax cut. Okay, what you can see is that no matter what the legislation said, and typically legislation not always, but legislation is going to say this is a permanent cut in taxes. What actually happens to effective tax rates is they mean revert pretty quickly. Okay, so in the end, in terms of actual taxes paid in the economy, the effect of these tax cuts is pretty transitory. Okay, so after uh, maybe 12 quarters, it's essentially uh, gone. Okay, so the kind of tax shocks that we're studying in the data are actually uh, pretty transitory. Okay, which kind of puts a finer point on the question because the question really becomes, is it the case that even these transitory cuts in taxes can have longer effects on GDP? Okay, and the answer you can see in these two panels at the top here, this is a response of GDP. Okay, you can see uh, at peak, uh, the median estimate is somewhere around maybe three quarters of a percent, and that lasts way, way longer than the tax cut itself. Okay, so after 32 quarters, we still see a, a large positive effect. Why does that happen? This here, this is a response of hours, a GDP per hour, okay, just raw labor productivity. And you can see that, you know, after 10 years after this transitory tax cut, labor productivity is still three quarters of a percentage point higher uh, than before. Okay, so corporate tax cuts, even though they're really transitory, have this really large persistent effect on labor productivity. Uh, okay, so why might that be? Okay, so here we're unpacking it. I mean, I guess, you know, with your with your macro hat, you might think, well, this is either about capital accumulation or it's about TFP. Okay, so bottom left panel, a lot of this is going to be about TFP. Okay, this is what's going to motivate us to think about, about an endogenous growth model. You can see that the response of TFP explains, let's say, most of the response of labor productivity. And looking at R&D, okay, so quite a persistent response of R&D. Um, okay, this kind of hump shape, pretty persistent response, R&D, and also uh, non-residential investment. Okay, so cut corporate taxes even for a few periods, really large effects of productivity, and it looks like they're coming both from R&D and also from, uh, from investments. Yeah, so the, the blue stuff, that's the estimated model. Okay, so it does a pretty good job matching the data. The model is gonna be estimated not just to fit this stuff, but also to fit what I'm gonna show you next, which is the responses to the personal tax cut, personal income tax cut. 
Okay, so again, whatever it says in legislation, the actual effect of the personal tax cut on uh, effective tax rates is pretty transitory. Okay, even more transitory than four, the personal tax would look like it's gone after about eight quarters. What's the effect? Okay, so large response of GDP and large response of labor productivity, but they look relatively uh, transitory. The TFP also responds a little bit, although also pretty transitory. And R&D, really no response, investment, pretty large response, but again, uh, relatively transitory. Okay, so to sort of summarize the evidence, corporate tax cuts, even though they're transitory, really large long-run effects on labor productivity. Personal tax cuts are even more transitory, have large but pretty transitory effects on labor productivity. Okay, so um, that's that's the evidence we're going to be working with. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing with, uh, with the model. Okay, so um, we're going to take this uh, semi-endogenous growth model uh, to the data. Um, so this is uh, a version of the Kamin and Gertner model, this model of R&D and adoption, uh, in which instead of being fully endogenous, it's semi-endogenous. Okay, what that does is, okay, what that means is uh, these transitory uh, shocks won't have literally permanent effects on GDP. Okay, so they might have arbitrarily persistent effects, but not literally permanent effects. Okay, so in that sense, there's no, I mean, if you want to call hysteresis, having a long run effect from a transitory, a permanent effect from a transitory shock, there is no true hysteresis in this model, but what there is, there is an arbitrarily persistent response uh, of the level of GDP, say, to a transitory shock. Okay, so in that sense, it's kind of, the estimation is gonna be conservative in that we're kind of biasing against finding permanent effects from transitory shocks. Okay, um, we're gonna augment the model with some features of the US tax system. Okay, so, um, so I didn't know a lot about the U.S. tax system. It turns out, if you believe our model, it's um, you know like incredibly important in determining the effects of these tax cuts. Okay, I'm going to show you some. Uh, so, and what I mean is like the really like in the weeds details of the U.S. tax system. Okay, I'm going to thrill you with some of that uh, in a bit. Okay, so what are the features? So one thing that's really important is that, in fact, the cost of produ producing innovation you can deduct from your taxes. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, so if I'm a firm. The labor share of R&D is like 90%. Okay, so almost all of R&D is kind of hiring scientists. The cost of hiring scientists, I can deduct directly from my profits. And therefore, um, the tax, uh, kind of implicitly, the tax system provides a subsidy for, for that kind of activity. Okay, contrast that to activities, uh, the types of investment that require much more investment in machinery. Machine, The cost of machinery is not deductible from my profits or not fully deductible from my profits. The tax system in, in, induces these distortions, and roughly speaking, the tax system favors uh, the production of R and D. Okay, the uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that um, when a firm in the U.S. buys intellectual property, okay, so if I go to Alan and I buy a patent from Alan, that I can't fully deduct from my taxes. Okay, so it's let's say that um, producing our uh, innovation in house versus buying innovation uh, from the street is treated very differently in the tax code. Okay, and again. That difference, the model is going to say, is going to be really important in driving the effects of taxation. Okay, so innovation is going to be a two-stage process. There's going to be this R&D stage in which firms sort of come up with kind of new ideas, prototypes, and this applied research or adoption, okay, very broadly conceived, that's when these ideas are going to turn into products. Uh, we're going to estimate this model to jointly match the responses to both sets of tax shocks. Okay, the, the two tax shocks, look very, very different than the responses. It's important that the model can, can speak to both. Okay, because in some sense, it would be very easy for a model to match the responses of one or the other. Matching them jointly turns out to be uh, more difficult. Okay, so how do taxes affect innovation and productivity? Okay, for the corporate tax uh, cut, what that does, okay, the kind of first order effect of a corporate tax cut is that it's going to increase the value of intellectual property. Okay, what do I mean by that? When um, you know, if I'm a firm that has a bunch of patents, when you cut my taxes, the value of those, those patents is going to go up. Okay, kind of the market value of those patents is going to go up. If I'm a very innovative firm and you cut taxes, my stock price uh, jumps. When that happens, that provides me with incentives to create more of that intellectual property. Okay, so more particularly, the value of intellectual property goes up. I want to do more of the kind of uh, R the kind of innovative activity which delivers cash flows today. Okay, so 
this applied research margin, that's where I'm turning something that's a prototype into a product that I can launch into market. That stuff has pretty front-loaded cash flows. I get the money uh, kind of today. Okay, so that means that I want to do more of it today. Of course, when I do more of that today, that also raises the value of creating more R&D, creating more ideas. Okay, and so in, in equilibrium, uh, I increase the value of intellectual property that gives me incentives to do more innovation. And as we know, innovation in these models has big spillovers that's going to further increase the value of intellectual property uh, and so on. What about the personal tax cut? Okay, it's relatively simple. I cut taxes. So my scientists earn more. They want to supply more labor. Um, okay, so labor supply and innovation goes up. That increases the returns to apply uh, to R&D and applied research and so on and so forth. Okay, so just uh, a very little bit on the model. Okay, just to, you know, you guys all know this model, but just uh, the kind of fixed idea. So intermediate goods firms, they produce with capital and, and labor. And there's gonna be A of these uh, firms. Uh, okay, so, and this A, this is an expanding variety model. The, the purpose of applied uh, research of, of adoption is to increase this A. So as the set of adopted technologies grows, uh, because this data is uh, greater than one, uh, the economy is okay, just a Romer model. Okay, so aggregate output is, you know, the, the kind of usual stuff, uh, capital with capital utilization, labor with labor utilization, and then we have this endogenous TFP there that increases when uh, firms carry out applied research. And the <laughs> stage prior to that, okay, before a firm can do applied research, there must exist this idea, this kind of prototype that can be transformed into uh, applied research. <laughs> So let me just uh, you know show you one part of the model, kind of the most important part of the model, which is the R and D uh, problem. Okay, so this is the the problem that are, it's very simple. The problem that innovator J uh, faces in the economy. Okay, so this stuff in here, this here, uh, so X is how many scientists I hire, and W is wages for scientists. Um, so the cost of R and D is how many scientists I'm hiring. And, and their wage. What are the returns to R&D? Well, for each unit, for each scientist hour I hire, this, this fee here, that's the productivity of R&D. Okay, so I'm gonna say that's how many new technologies I got. Uh, and what's the value of that? Well, technologies have a price, patents, let's say have a price, and that price is gonna be uh, PC. Okay, so for the individual innovator, what do they earn in a period? The difference between the value of the technologies they produce and the cost of producing them uh, and that's going to be taxed at this rate, which is the corporate tax rate. What is uh, what is this fee? Okay, this is a model with um, externalities, uh, two kinds. The first is that there's a congestion externality. Okay, the more in aggregate, the more scientists are hired, the less effective each scientist is. Okay, so productivity is decreasing in aggregate uh, science labor, and productivity is increasing in the stock of knowledge. Okay, as a standard in this model, but Notice that there's a parameter a zeta here. That's a number greater than zero. That means that the increase in productivity as the stock of knowledge grows is less than linear. Okay, that's the import of the semi-endogenous growth model. This is a model in which, as the economy grows, ideas are getting harder to find. Okay, so what does the first order condition look like in the aggregate? Uh, uh, it looks like this. Okay, so it's kind of straightforward. So we have the you know wage over price. You can see that if I invert. That's going to tell me how many scientists are hired in the aggregate. Now, if you look at this for a second, the one thing that doesn't show up here at all is taxes, right? So taxes have no direct effect on the decision to innovate. All right, why is that? Well, because I fully deduct the cost of R&D for my profits. You can see that simply in the first order condition, the tax rate drops out. Okay, so the effect of changing the tax rate on innovation must be through these objects. Okay, either I don't know, the wage changes, etc. Really what's going on here is uh, the price, the value of a patent is going to change uh, when I change the corporate tax. Okay, why is that? Now we're gonna talk about the US tax system. Okay, really? Okay, so the US tax system allows what's called a uh, straight line amortization for purchased uh, intellectual property. Okay, this is uh, this is something from, you know, very celebrated and influential paper by Holland Jorgensen. What that means is, what is the price of a patent here. Okay, I'm calling one of these ideas a patent. What is the price of a patent? This J here, that's kind of a fundamental value. That's the cash flows that I derive from owning a patent. In this model, what, what are the, where do those come from? Those come from eventually the fact that one of these new ideas, one of these patents, is eventually 
going to turn into a product and I have monopoly, I have some monopoly uh, power with that product. I'm going to earn pure profits. That's going to mean that, you know, there's some fundamental value to having this patent. That's not it though, because, because of the tax code, there's an extra piece to this, which is that in every period, I get to deduct some portion of the cost of purchasing that patent from my profits for tax purposes. That's what amortization means. Okay, so the tax code, depending on how much it allows me to deduct from my taxes in future periods, is going to affect the value of that patent. Okay, so we follow Winbury, who does some stuff like this for um, kind of a, a capital investment. Okay, we follow a similar strategy for R&D. And in the end, what we get to is that, you know, the after-tax price of a patent depends, of course, on the fundamental cash flows, but then there's this wedge here, which depends on future corporate taxation and the specific details of the tax code. Okay, so when I change corporate taxes, what happens is I'm going to change the price of a patent. How much the price of a patent changes in response to a change in taxes depends on exactly how uh, the tax system uh, works. Okay, so this is just this wedge, which responds to changes in, in taxes, even if those changes in taxes are uh, transitory. Okay, and uh, this stuff we're all going to take from, you know, we're going to calibrate from, from data. Uh, yes. okay, but that's great. okay, so uh, let me show you uh, what the model says about why or how a labor productivity responds. This is a simple, you know, from the estimated model, this is a simple linear decomposition of labor productivity. The panel on the left is for, for the corporate income tax cut. The panel on the right is for the personal income tax. Okay, so what explains the increase in uh, labor productivity in response to corporate income tax cut? This purple stuff, that's capital utilization. Okay, in the short run, firms utilize capital more heavily when you cut their taxes. What about the long run effect? So I would say uh, this, so this uh, yellow area, that's going to be the endogenous productivity component. And then the green area, that's capital even. Okay, so over the long run, when I cut corporate taxes, even for a short period of time, Firms are going to accumulate, there's going to be more R&D and adoption. So in this endogenous piece is going to grow. But of course, physical capital is complementary to that, um, to those technologies. So also there's investment in, in capital. What about for the personal income tax code? Okay, that's more like a sugar rush. Okay, so this uh, blue area, that's labor utilization. Okay, so when I cut their taxes, workers work harder. That explains this kind of short run jump in productivity, and that fades uh, relatively quickly. Okay, so. Uh, the almost final thing I'm going to show you is some counterfactuals for the model. Okay, what happens uh, as I change uh, features of the model? The first thing I'm showing you, I think, is, yeah, what happens in the model? Okay, so same estimates. I'm just going to switch off endogenous productivity. Okay, so um, just going to focus on this panel here in the middle. Okay, this is the response of labor productivity. The black line, that's the baseline I just showed you, the decomposition in which endogenous productivity and capital deepening both accounted for the persistence, persistent response to productivity. This green line, this is a counterfactual in which the only channel is capital accumulation. Okay, so you can see that basically the entire persistence of the response is gone once I switch off endogenous productivity. What that means is capital accumulation alone cannot explain with plausible parameters this really persistent response to productivity. Okay, this turns out to have some important policy implications, okay, because if you look at how the, the yeah, CBO, that's what it's called, right, now I'm, now I'm panicking, the CBO uh, scores tax cuts, they basically think the longer effect of tax cuts is all about this capital accumulation, and they don't think about this piece here, this endogenous productivity. You can see, if you're thinking the only longer effect of, capital, of tax cuts is about capital accumulation, you're essentially missing uh, a really large part of the response. It's not true that they completely ignore R&D, but they certainly don't treat it in a way uh, consistent with how we think about it in economic theory. Okay, so switching off R&D, the response uh, of labor productivity is uh, essentially gone. The next uh, counterfactual I want to show you is what happens if I make the tax system treat R&D more favorably? Okay, I'm going to let firms deduct more of the cost of purchasing R&D. I'm going to provide a greater subsidy through the tax system for the purchase uh, of intellectual property products. So you can see that switching off endogenous productivity and this other counterfactual with higher deductions for ID purchases look very, very similar to each other. Okay, so the effect of uh, changing the tax system so that firms can now deduct a greater share of the cost, the response to a current corporate taxes looks 
kind of the same as in a model with no endogenous productivity. Okay, the responses of the labor to, to the personal income tax shock look very different. Okay, so in my, from my perspective, the two are not observationally equivalent because I get information out of this uh, response to the personal income tax shock. But if I only looked at the response to uh, corporate tax cut, you know, the, the tax code plays a really large role in explaining how these shocks uh, translate. Um, okay, that's not to say that a world in which there's endogenous TFP is the same. Because of course, if I have this high IP deduction, that also means that in steady state, there's a lot more technology adoption. Okay, so the level of the economy is much larger in this world, but the response of the economy to this shock uh, looks very similar. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. Um, yes, I'm gonna end uh, on this slide here. Actually, sorry, let me just say one thing. Because so far what I've said is it kind of sounds like personal income tax cuts don't matter. Okay, and that's not true. Okay, the reason that they look like they don't matter and what I've showed you is because in fact, in the data, those shocks are really transitory. They're more transitory than the personal, than the corporate income tax cuts. Okay, so to give you an idea, to put these on an equal footing, what I've plotted here is the labor productivity decomposition for another experiment in which I do permanent tax cuts. Okay, I'm gonna cut corporate taxes permanently. I'm gonna cut uh, personal taxes permanently. And this is what the responses look like. Okay, this is a 1% cut in the corporate tax rate a 1% cut in the personal tax rate. Okay, so of course, the tax base for the personal income is orders of magnitude, an order of magnitude larger than for the corporate income tax. Okay, so this is very expensive in revenue terms. This is very relatively cheap in revenue terms. Okay, so they're not like for like, this is 1% cut. So what does it look like? You can see that for a 1% permanent cut in the corporate tax rate, the model says long-run GDP goes up about 3%. For a 1% cut in the personal income tax rate, long-run GDP goes up about one and a half percent. Okay, you can see that the, the explanation is similar. Mostly it's about endogenous TFP, but that also, of course, leads to more capital information. And uh, okay, finally, this is okay, this is a model in which we're, what we're saying is the world looks kind of neoclassical. Okay, I cut taxes, the prices of goods go up, therefore, that encourages me to produce more uh, goods. And we're applying that logic to the production of intellectual property. Okay, so this is some evidence, some more direct evidence that that channel. Uh, is present in the world. Okay, so I guess the first sense check is this is stock returns. Okay, so we see persistent positive responses of the value of the stock market to the cuts in corporate tax rates. We also see persistent responses in patent filings. Maybe more uh, subtle, this here, trademark transactions. This is a measure. Okay, this is the response to the corporate tax cut for how frequently firms buy uh, trademarks from each other. In other words, when I cut corporate taxes, what happens is firms trade more in trademarks. I start buying more brands. I start buying, buying more products from other firms. There's more trade in intellectual property in response to the corporate tax code. And finally, uh, the value of intangibles. Okay, so like a, a finer grain measure of uh, the stuff that we're thinking about here. Okay, those kind of intellectual property products, you can also see a positive uh, model of response. Okay, so I'll leave you with that. So, New evidence on the effect of tax cuts. If you want to take one number away, a 1% transitory corporate income tax cut, three quarters of a percentage uh, um, higher labor productivity 10 years out. Why? Because even transitory changes in corporate tax cuts drive increases in R&D and applied research. And that explains uh, the persistence of the responses. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Since you showed the stock market value for it by a stock market response, because that should be the one that front loads everything. Yeah, so I, I would like if you had if this had been now four percent initially. Love it, great question. So what we're working on now? Okay, this is the entire stock market, and of course, innovation is a relatively small part. Okay, so what we're working on now is in splitting the sample of stock returns into maybe like high patent and low patent firms. We have some preliminary evidence that for the, the the more intellectual property rich a firm is, the higher its response on impact. Okay, so exactly getting at your your comment. Okay, so that's that's so that'll be in the paper. Hopefully soon. Yeah. Look, that chart and also the, the initial chart on, on taxes, they seem to be just at a trend. Well, where where are we looking? The stock market return chart. So if I think about, it, I don't know where you put the data. But, you know, you had an upward trend in in, in stock markets over your sample period, and presumably the tax on average were also over the sample period. So. So uh, these, these mean, responses are all relative to trend, right? They are relative. Yes, to everything trend. is relative to trend, including taxes. Corporate taxes, in fact, fall dramatically over the sample period. So the shocks we observe are also shocks okay. relative to that trend. 
That's good. So the question about um, your model, uh, about how your model differentiates between, as you know, the cuts in corporate taxes themselves just for everybody and the change over time in the R&D deductibility because it's not been stable either in the U.S., particularly over the sample that you're talking about. Yeah, so there's one change in that. In 1993, there was the introduction of uh, so um, so one thing that's uh, that we're kind of lucky with is the Roma and Roma sample is not every legislative change in federal taxes; it's a subset, and we're just lucky in that a lot of the kind of gnarly issues we managed to avoid. So, for instance, um, when the deductibility of R&D was increased, that specific episode is not in our sample. So. Of course, that's not a complete answer to your question. The other thing we can do is, so we don't have a lot of shocks, so we don't have like a massive amount of power. What we do do is we re-estimate everything, dropping one episode at a time. Okay, so when I first saw these results, I told my co-authors, this is all about Reagan. Okay, so it turns out even when you drop the Reagan tax cuts, you know, the effects look remarkably stable, uh, dropping one uh, specific episode. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, that was kind of, that was not all what I was my, my other thing is that your sample doesn't go past 2006, obviously. That's so right. The question I'm going to ask now is probably irrelevant, mostly irrelevant, but the fact in this the stock, stock market is a huge amount of what's going on in terms of R&D and intellectual property now is not in public companies. It's in private companies, very private. And so, you know, their stock prices do not exist. Um, and so that's very much last. 15 years kind of yeah on, honestly, yeah as opposed to prior to that so um i don't know i don't you might be able to tease it out from pat filings and stuff like that yes. but if you're relying on uh on truly just corporate data if there's any open in future to carry this forward you're going to have to do some of that absolutely <laughs> that's very interesting so, because what also has happened is of course a, a really liquid market and trade in those private firms has emerged and so yeah. i was talking to some accounting yeah. people about this and you know, private equity firms. Part of what they're thinking is, how do I, ma which firm do I purchase so that I can maximize the deductions I get for buying this intellectual property? Well, yeah. well and then so, I was going to ask you what you did about Carrie Institute. That's a bridge too far. Which is what the more private they are, then the tax rate is completely different. Right. Tax so that's uh, that's something that's hard to capture. Yeah. So stopping in, in 2006 is a great thing for us. It's been a weekend on the list, tax cuts. Do you guys have fun? Okay, I'm done. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you to the organizers for putting a page on the program. <laughs> so the usual, as I'm also at the Fed now, the usual Fed disclaimer uh, on the paper applies. So the question we are after in this paper is how long do the effects of monetary contractions or monetary intervention last? There's an old question. To get at it, what we do here is we use a historical panel that spans 115 years of data starting 1900 up until 2015. It's for 17 now advanced economies. I'll tell you what the countries are. The main variables we're going to look at are GDP, that's the main variable of interest. Um, do monetary shocks, do they have very persistent effect on GDP and how persistent? And in the spirit of a solo decomposition, we also want to look at what channels may be operating. Like unlike the previous two papers, we don't have data on R&D or investment uh, in, in, in patents and so forth. So we're going to take a stock of it at a, through a broader level and looking at capital, labor, and what we're going to call the residual as a solo as a TFP. The identification here is going to come from uh, the trilemma uh, idea in international finance. I'm going to spend some time on this, but very briefly, if a country is pegged to another country, let's call the Denmark is pegged to the US during the Bretton Woods, then if US changes interest rates, that Danish interest rates are going to move in the same direction. They're going to be, there's going to be a positive correlation, and that positive correlation is what we're going to need to construct an instrumental variable. Then we're going to use local projections instrumental variable methods to estimate these impulse responses of, of these identified monetary shocks. In our sample, we won't have identification of shocks for the US and the UK because 
in much of history, US and UK were, were, were base countries, which other countries were pegging. So what we're going to do is also check for um, validity for of our results for, for, for US and the UK. What we find in this paper is uh, we find large and very persistent effects of these monetary shocks. So 12 years out, GDP is lower relative to a pre-shock trend by about three to five percentage points, um, depending on what sample you look at, full sample or which is a post-World War II sample. When we look under the hood in the spirit of a solo decomposition, we find labor falls, crisis, of financial monetary shock induces a recession, but labor returns back to the pre-shock trend 12 years out, 12 years later. What doesn't return and what explains why GDP is persistently lower are our capital and GFP. So this, to some extent, suggests this uh, that models of endogenous growth same endogenous growth could be driving these, 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 these movements that we see in, in, in GDP. Now, going beyond that, we also want to know whether loosening shocks and contraction shocks have similar effects or not. Like if contraction shocks destroy the economy and you have this scarring effect, can loosening shock and central bank reverse those shocks and, 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 and undo these effects? So what we find is there's an asymmetry, there's a sign asymmetry. Uh, loosening shocks uh, tend to not have these persistent effects. So the word harmful and harmless is in terms of these persistent effects. And whereas tightening shocks have these very, very persistent effects um, in, 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 in the historical data. Now, as I already alluded to, we uh, don't have identification for the US and the UK economies. So what we're going to do is we basically take these very published papers, these recently published papers and the AER, Asia Macro and European Economic Review, which have identification of monetary shocks for the US and the UK. For the US, Bruno Meyer, Pali, Sastri, and Sims, they have identification by the Sligo Bond heteroscedasticity. Uh, there is a Walker episode with, with a lot of volatility, and then there's a non Walker episode with not as much volatility, and identify monetary shocks using that idea. And then there is a Miranda Gripinu and Rico paper, which take these Gertler Karabi high frequency um, shocks, but cleans them for information effects by projecting them on Green Book forecasts. It takes the residual. So we basically just download the code and extend. All we do is their horizon for impulse responses is 48 months. We say change 48 to 96, and we, we estimate the impulse response. Um, we also look at evidence for the UK. These are again high frequency uh, instruments for, for the UK that uh, Cesa Bianchi and co is constructed. So, since we only have 15 minutes more, we're going to jump directly to the empirical analysis. So, what we do is we um, use this data set that Oscar and Alan have with Morris Shilari, the Jordan Shilari Taylor Macro History Database where we have data on interest rates, output, investment, uh, inflation, house prices, stock prices, various kinds of financial variables. This is for 17 now advanced economies. Um, these are Australia, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, UK, and the US. We combine this database with um, the database constructed by uh, economists, uh, which some of them used to be the Bank of France, it's for long-term productivity database from where we have information on hours worked, number of employees, product take a product of these two variables, we call that labor. Then they constructed capital stock using perpetual inventory methods from investment in machines and buildings. We played around with various ways of constructing um, this capital stock measure. Our results are a robust to variety of uh, um, growth rate estimates or initial values that we use. And then, so this is a labor, this is K, we impose a Cobb Douglas aggregate production function with a capital share, and we back out a solar residual that we're going to call TFP. So this is the annual data from 1900 to 2015. We exclude world wars in, in our sample. So how does the identification of shock work? The identification of shock really comes from this other paper that Alan and Oscar have with Maurice Shularik. Um, it's in JME. We're going to divide the population of countries into three subpopulations. There are going to be peg countries, Denmark in the Bretton Woods. There are going to be base countries, US in the Bretton Woods. And there are going to be float countries which are not pegging to the US. 
in that in, the, in, the, in that sample. So going to to think of capital mobility, we think of uh, we're going to use the index, the continuous index in the international finance literature constructed by Quinshin and Toyota, where one denotes capital openness, zero is capital close to capital account, one is open. We're going to classify a country to be pegging if it not only pegged its currency this year, but it also pegged its currency last year. This will think of a little bit of selection into and out of pegs. So you have to be in a peg for at least two years uh, for, for us to think of that as a considerable shot. The definition of peg here comes from um, Jay Shambhog, Nilgatsky, Reinhard Rogo um, classification where your exchange rate moves within plus minus 2% um, exchange rate bank. Instrument that we construct then, Z for a country J at time T is basically this interest rate residual. So this is the interest rate change, annual year on year interest rate change in the base country that corresponds to country J. We're gonna, we don't need to take the raw interest rate changes. We residualize these interest rate changes by projecting these interest rates on base country macro financial controls and their lags. We don't have data on expectations. Ideally, you want to project them on expectations and what the policymakers want to do. This is a long sample. So this is uh, that sort of a cleaning strategy in terms of residualizing. So that we can think of that these shocks are not anticipated to the extent that base country macro financial variables don't, 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 don't predict them. We're going to take that residual and uh, adjust for capital mobility. So at home, the country home is J, which is in a peg. The intervention variable is going to be interest rate on a short-term government, nominal interest in a short-term government bill. The trial and instrument is, is the variable Z. And then we're going to look at effects uh, of, of, of these instrumented interest rate changes. On, on macroeconomic variables uh, in, in Denmark, uh, for example, during Bretton Woods. To look at what the residualized interest rate changes look like. So these are just interest rate changes in the base country. So this graph gives you an idea of throughout our sample, what the base countries have been. So in the pre-World War I, UK is classified as a base country. Between the world wars, there's a hybrid of UK, US, and France. We put a weight of one third on each. The results don't really depend on um, that that much. Um, then in the post-World War II, we have UK uh, as a base country for, for Australia up until 1968. And then we have um, US largely as a, as a base country for countries. And then in the, in the European monetary system, Germany emerges as, 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 as a base country. And these are interest rate changes in the base country uh, in, our, in our sample. So big episodes are uh, there's a tightening in the in the in the in the in around the Great 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 Depression. Then there is a Volcker episode in Germany. You see uh, Otto Paul uh, was a, was a, was a Bundesbank governor president, and then the Volcker period, and then some tightening around the financial crisis. So the first stage. So in first stage we we are regressing interest rates in the home country, country J. On, on the instrument that we constructed, we take the residualized interest rate changes adjust for capital mobility, that's the variable Z. And then you have a vector of home economy, macro financial controls. It's a, basically a kitchen sink. We have stock prices, house prices, long-term interest rates, short-term interest rates, the lags of short-term interest rates and, and, and a variety of other variables. And then a country fixed effects. So what this uh, table shows you is the pass through. So when this instrument goes up by 100 basis points, the pass through into home interest rates is, is about 60 basis points. It's large, it's not one to one, but it's uh, two things to take away is uh, this pass through is significant uh, and the key statistics are, are pretty large. We don't have a weak instrument uh, problem. And you can rationalize this these coefficients from our 2% exchange rate band. If you took a Krugman Swenson uh, uh, exchange rate band uh, model, which is what uh, Alan and Mori and uh, Jay Shambhav did in their R statistics paper. So we have the first stage interest rate changes uh, that are instrumented by this instrument. Then what you do is uh, you're going to do is local projections to estimate the cumulative impulse response function of a variable y, country j, at horizon h relative to horizon minus one. These are horizon specific country fixed effects vector of home economy macro financial controls and beta h is going to directly 
uh, give us a cumulative impulse response of GDP for Denmark at horizon 10 or horizon 5 um, relative to horizon minus 1 to think of as a pre shock trend uh, in, in, in the sector side. The standard errors, we're going to cluster them at the country level and we're going to use um, Driscoll Cray uh, standard errors to think of uh, uh, spatial. Um, we also have uh, the main exercise with spatial uh, uh, correction with the, the, the spatial autocorrelation correction with the Driscoll Cray. So, this is the main result. The main result here we're plotting is impulse response of GDP in the pegging country 12 years out, this years to 100 basis point interest rate uh, treatment at home. There's a full sample, 1900-2015, fourth quarter of the sample, 1948-2015. The bands here are 68 and 95% discrete gray standard bands. What you see is in response to this interest rate shock, which makes home interest rate go up by 100 basis point, GDP is lower by about five or three percentage points, depending on the sample you look at. And 12 years out, this is, it has a very persistent effect on, 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 on macroeconomic variable with GDP. To see what you know, Seba was showing, that these shocks are really temporary, they're transitory. To see that here is the home nominal interest rate, the short term interest rate, uh, the three month interest rate on three month government bill, it go, it's normalized to go up by 100 basis points, but then within three to four years, it comes back to zero. So it's, it, it is a response to a transitory interest rate movement that we find this effect 12 years out. You see, a, as you would expect, there is this uh, prices fall, and this, it's a demand-driven shock, and, and that's, that, that's what um, you see there. Now we do a lot of robustness. There are lots of obvious concerns with, with, with the exercise that we, we have done. It's a long sample. You want to first think of maybe are the pre trends? Was the question came up with the I was asking this question was GDP already declining before this shock happened? So we added two annual lags of control. So this is why this coefficient is zero. So then we don't really see eight years back, there are no, no pre trends uh, in, this, in this exercise. Other question is you, what Jose was, uh, Jose was alluding to. In our sample, we have a panel local projection. So we drop one country at a time to see and re estimate the impulse responses and see whether those have this persistent effect or not. We find that barely changes the picture. They all seem to have these very tight, uh, no one country is moving our sample. Our, our results. Then we drop five year windows at a time. You may worry there are these particular episodes, maybe Great Depression is driving the result, maybe um, financial crisis driving the result, maybe Walker. Tight episode is driving the results. We find um, it seems to be still very, very persistent effects of, 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 of local shocks. We also have a small open economy in UK's in model. The idea of that model in the paper is, is to think about exclusion restriction violations, right? So you may be worried that it's not really because of the interest rate passed through that you have this effect in GDP, but there are these other channels, for example, in open economy. If US goes into a recession, it reduces demand for tradable goods from Denmark, and that's another channel. It's not really the interest rate channel that that's happening, but it's the demand for tradable goods that, that's, that's going up. So this the instrument may have an effect on, on variable through channels that don't go through interest rates, right? And so what we do is we use the model to put bounds on the tradable demand, for example, and then we re-estimate this exercise uh, using a control function approach and what we find is a shaded area, probably hard to see. There is a green uh, shaded area, which is a spillover corrected uh, uh, impulse response. And we find it's, it's, it's within, the, within the confidence bands. We also be, go beyond the model and say, well, you may be worried there are uh, base country macroeconomic variables may matter. You may be worried there are global trends. So if global GDP, goes into a recession, it's just a structural break in some sense, uh, that may be affecting the results. You may be worried that there is spillovers that happen through current account or spillovers that happen through exchange rates. We control for uh, these open economy variables, uh, also uh, current value and two lags in, in, the thing, in the spirit of thinking exclusion system violation um, in, this, in this exercise. 
uh, we estimate by using bipyron, we estimate five structural break dates for each country in TFP growth process. We, we add those structural break dates. We find um, very persistent effects uh, of GDP. Now thinking about what are the mechanisms through which these, these, these persistent effects may be propagating, what we do is we do a solar decomposition. We look at uh, responses of labor, capital, and the constructed solar residual. So this is the response of GDP, the first, uh, first, first column here, which I showed you earlier, that in response to month shock, GDP is lower by about 5 percentage, 4.5 percentage points in the full sample. Labor falls, but it comes back. So 12 years out, it's back to the pre-shock trend. Capital and TFP is where you see this persistent effect. And importantly, um, the magnitude that you see with capital and TFP seems to suggest there is some co-integration as, as would come out of endogenous growth models that capital and TFP are co-integrated. And you see, you, you kind of see that in this, in this, in this um, graph. Now, when you think of whether contractionary expansion shocks have the same persistent effect, um, we look at whether interest rates tightening in, in the base economy, what are the effects of those interest rate tightenings on, on the pegging economy or, or the instrument to the instrument. We find the effects are larger than, than the uh, sample where you treat the shock symmetric. Um, labor response is a bit more pronounced now, and you see big effects in capital and TFP. But if you look at expansionary shocks, you don't see these persistent effects here. Just for the sake of comparison, we, we change the coefficient uh, of, the, of the shock so that we can compare the same axis. So it's again, expansionary shock, but just written in a negative way to, to, to be able to compare the axis. And you see, they, they, these aren't uh, significant uh, permanent responses or persistent responses that we see. Now that's largely, our papers, identification from, from using a trilemma instrument or, or this long sample that spans 115 years. We also um, basically went to these um, replication packages in AEJ, Macro, AER, and European Economic Review, downloaded these replication packages and changed 48 to 96 months. And these are basically impulse responses from shocks that other people have. This is from Miranda Gripino Rico. This is the interest rates identified um, to a VAR um, in a Gertler Karadi VR, which has financial variables, excess bond premium, et cetera, in, in it, but they are clean for cleaned up information effect. So interest rates go up in the US by year two, they're back to zero. Whereas these effects by year eight, you seem to have very persistent, not as big as we found in the trilemma IV, but they, they, they are pretty large. This is Bromaya Palia Safri Sims, which is identification with hyperspedasticity. Here you find a bit more pronounced effects, more like our identification. You see interest rates are high, remain elevated for about four years in this exercise. And you see industrial production effects are a bit more sizable um, in that than the than, 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 um, previous one. And then, so this is for the UK, same exercise in the UK. Uh, these guys have a monthly estimate of GDP. Um, the growth rates go up by 100 basis points, and then by year two, they're back to zero. And you see this very persistent effects uh, eight, eight years out on, 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 on GDP. So that's that. That's a paper. So we find um, evidence that effects of monetary interventions may be more persistent than we have uh, commonly believed. Um, Monetary tightening shock causes output to decline over a long period of time, and we find this effect goes through capital stock and TFP. Uh, in the paper, we also have evidence uh, to show how this identification um, in principle could work in a small open economy in UKNZ model to think about various uh, margins in which that intuition fail and how we can think about it in, in the empirics. Um, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Commonalities in your for example. Um, I'll, I'll give you such a long step. Maybe you found a way 
part of the information that you said, um, adjust for this, but it occurred to me that my best guess would be is the shock center monetary policy responses are way more affordable across countries in the second half of your sample than in the first part of your sample, where things may have been more heterogeneous. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's just that's what my intuition so I should never say this during this time in the room. It's been sad. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna correct me. And and so my I guess I have a kind of open-ended question about what sort of a role of anything that we play in your data. You seem to have pretty similar results regardless across the two halves, but I'm just curious as to whether that that could um that could be important. So there was um, in the previous version of the paper, we even started the 1870 in the first paper, this data set goes to 1870. Yeah. The reason we stopped start 1900 is we want to compare with the long-term productive database. There you see much bigger effects. Um, these effects are, they do become bigger. It just worked out that focusing on 1900, 2015 allowed us to show similar responses across these were even bigger to be unpalatable in some sense that uh, people were, were wondering uh, these are, are pretty large so but if we go back start 1890 or 70 you would see this going down to about seven percent or six percent so that, that, that kind that's of a small that kind of fits my intuition but i was but also i should have said alan will take all the questions yeah. <laughs> You, you go back to the uh, charts. Yeah. So, I mean, because we're focusing just on what, what's being driven by the base country, yeah. we, we've only got one or two bases. Like, in, yeah. Um, yeah. So, in that sense, other countries may be doing monetary policy but we're not paying attention to them. We're just restricting to things driven yeah. by what these things do. So, um, we're missing a lot of other shots, which is why we show that other identification. The US UK. Uh, but these shots alone seem like a clean way to focus on countries that would give like monetary autonomy to some degree. Oh, um, no, that, that logic makes a lot of sense to me, but I was the. Uh, it was more than the. I thought that the sheer volatility in the earlier part of this thing would just be more important than it is tonight. Which it is, is which it is. The 19th century <laughs> to find it. So, yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's more volatility in the basis once we get to five, when we get to gold, it's like four pounds. Yeah, oh, yeah. Stuff going on. So. Can I ask a question to the, to the invitation? In some sense, it's a bit depressing for a policy to think, you know, yeah, you know, I'm going to depress long run growth. But maybe maybe I'm thinking it wrong, but I'm mean, yeah, in the assumption. Yeah, the asymmetry. You can only screw up. You can't make it spread. Yeah. So, and then you have very little impact. And you have very little impact on inflation. I think it's far, you know, it's very barely significant. Well, actually, not significant. In the in the post World War sample, it's a bit more substantial than the full sample. Okay. But, uh, but but then I was thinking, in some sense, it's sort of more. Or maybe I'm misinterpreting. It's the shocks like something like you know, I'm I'm basically forced to you know tighten my rates by because I'm picking. So even though they're not in line with my fundamentals, that's basically what I'm looking at. So it's basically if I screw up, I'm, that's the bad thing. I mean, I could all interpret it. Something unwarranted to macro fundamentals screws me up in the long run. Isn't that what you really show? Maybe that's an implication question. Yeah, but the theory part of this shows that under some assumptions, what you recover from this impulse response, if I'm, if I'm say, Spain, forced by paying for Germany to raise by 100 bills, uh, Accidentally against my will. That 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 impulse response is the same as if I was staying on the table rule and I accidentally went down to the basis of the state. Yeah, they 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 are 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 they what was bad for Spain instead of predicting what the funds banks do? No, but uh, for the pegging mm -hmm. countries, it's implicitly here you're controlling for a vector of macro financial variables, which include implicitly, but you could have just done 
a Taylor rule and then see how much is my interest rate deviates from. But this is the Taylor rule, right? So this is the instrument that makes the interest rate move. This is controlling for base economy macro financial control vari variables, right? Lags, not the contemporaneous one, but lags. So say like anything that happened last two years, predict uh, uh, interest rate changes. You say, I want to clean that away and just focus on the instrumented ones. So in, in the sense it is doing yeah. that for the for this country as well. Yeah. If you like the concept of we, we don't have like high frequency, you know, intraday changes in the curve or something or futures going back to the nineteen seventies. So we don't have a high frequency of it. We're not just spending like, hundred years in the archives doing the narratives for 17 times. No, no, no. So I, I, I think this, that's the this, instrument. This is why what can we but this one does it, right? They, they take the got like are the instruments and project regress them on green book forecasts which takes into account expectations um yeah i think some historians have actually gone back to banking and archives and started to do what did they do in the 1970s like what was daily change and i'm doing some of that with these the things and then goes to the fd or so you know when the bank did this in 1963 you know the finance but yeah, that, that, no one's done any of that really, but it's much before 1990. I'm sure it's been changed, around the basement of the the cost of borrowing instead of five four percent now it's five percent for two years accidentally, and then after three years it's back to normal, right? And now, what, eight years later, TV is five percent just because of this period of two years of interest rates that were a little bit too high. That might have picture a model with the models which they were presented, it's semi endogenous growth model. If you have, have we have any uh, um, basically strong aggregate demand effects in Joseba's model has more flexible prices towards more flexible part but if you had more demand effects so we have a recession the uh, the economy is in a, in, a, in a recession gdp is lower the market size shrinks for your r d so you reduce r d in, in this again how it kind of models and that temporary reduction I, if you're a, 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 this one percentage point extra for two years, does this generate already an assumption? Yeah, it, it is. This this is the monetary shock literature. All the papers are that's the that. monetary shock literature generating. It has been one year or two years. So the question is the history of this method and it gets that not um, negative shock. So somehow it has to really the stock variables like the capital of PFP or, or patents or innovation. Um, and yeah, we can we can calibrate a model to do that. We can calibrate a model to do anything, but yeah, it's not out of line with what that, that literature finds. But just yeah. it's not NBR recession, it's just like saying GDP falls, industrial production falls, right? That's what the thing you're not saying predicting NBR dating recessions with, with these monetary shocks. So yeah, we we have no shame, right? So these these other authors always stop at 36 or 48 months because the retain of what happens. Exactly. And we're like, let's pull back the curve. But you can see what happens, it keeps going. And so I guess, just, I guess they are uh, a little bit afraid of showing that because they think the model gets less credit when they show it. <laughs> no, you put back the but this is just you know, saying it's not it's not I mean it's it's still a confidence in what is happening. Maybe you should know about it. I don't know what you're saying, but we're kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. afraid to show it to you. We go over it. <laughs> well, thank so you so much.